Anyway, welcome to the More Than Pod... Fuck, what are we called? More Than Cricket Podcast. <laughs> yeah. Title no. Autumn. Um, yeah, so, yeah, we are just talking about Saturday, but... Yeah, 150, so... And, and you said the wicket wasn't that bad. No, nah, no, it wasn't, um, wasn't bad at all. It just, yeah, just a few brain fades and, you know, the pressure started to build a bit and then all of a sudden, you know, 150 seemed a long way away when you need, you know, what, 60 runs and with three wickets in hand, it almost becomes impossible. Did you boys win the toss? Yeah, yeah. No, we, to be fair, we fielded extremely well. Um, bold fucking well. It was re- like probably our most complete performance in the field. That was exceptional. Um, and then it was almost a case of, I oh, will score 150 runs. And then I don't think guys realize you actually have to score them. <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden it was like a shot out, just random shots out, bit of pressure. And you know, the likes of like Dougie and Scotty and Gus and stuff, they've been in sort of pressured games more so than that Heathcote squad. Yeah. Um, so yeah, ended up you know, just falling short and it was a tough bit of pill to swallow. I mean, I'm possibly the, the worst loser on earth. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't an easy, um, sort of debrief, but, um, yeah, I just, I, I yeah, it was, it was really, really tough. Um, you know, and, and the easy thing to do is to, you know, quickly sort of cover it up with all the good things we've done. Um, but I sort of said to the boys, um, because I was, I was really emotional because I just felt, you know, this was such a good opportunity for us to actually, you know, win the whole thing. Um, I truly believe like we beat Burnside quite easily in the group stages. Um, and if I, I felt if we got to a final, we had a pretty good chance just as they had a good chance. But once you're in that final, then, you know, anything can happen. So I really thought that was going to be the case, but, you know, I was, visibly quite upset in the change room and um one of our players sort of try to cover it up with um you know all the good stuff we've done and the ac- different accolades and all that sort of stuff and i said just calm down there like you need to sit here and you need to feel this because this is what you know this this stuff should drive you for the next time you're in a pressure situation that you don't want to feel this again. And um, I, I made the boys sit there, feel it, understand it, and make sure that if they are afforded the opportunity to play in another game that is in a pressured moment, that they can um, sort of do the right things and get us over the line. You know, that's the difference between being a, a dangerous side that can beat anyone in this day, and that's the difference that and then the difference between being the um, championship title winning teams, like the Saints yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, and, and that, that all that probably is is like a, a mindset shift, right? Like going through like pool play, being like pretty relaxed about cricket, but then maybe lumping that additional pressure on yourself. Like Especially if guys haven't been in semifinals and things like that, like do you think it's like the added element that fuck I'm in a semifinal here and things just tense up a bit and guys play a bit different or yeah i think it's a combination of a lot of things like not you know having done it before like you said um not being being involved in those playoff games consistently um but one thing that i took away from playing with saints was um it was like an energy thing like it was incredible as soon as the pressure came on there were five guys in the team that were you know, played over 200 games each. And their names, was, it was Ben Langro, James O'Gorman, um, Matt Holstein, Aaron Johnson, and who's the other one? Greg Dawson. And those guys, like, as soon as the pressure came on, all of a sudden, you just saw them like... Switch. It was just incredible. And the minor games we won from behind that we were just never going to win um, was just unbelievable. And it was purely down to an energy shift and they could just sense it and just switch on at that stage and all of a sudden it was just you just watch it unfold in front of your eyes just as you watch it unfold when it becomes a debacle but it'll always unfold the right way for these guys and the question is why and um yeah and for me it's just that ability to be aware of that moment and then 
be able to um, control that moment and control that battle in that moment. And then if you come out on top and there's five people coming out on top in that moment, you're more than likely going to win the game. Yeah, so it's almost like sensing that that opportunity and stepping up. Like you either step up at that point or you go into your shell and, and sort of cave. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, that's probably like a hard thing to teach. Like you probably get that through experience, but um, yeah, that's a fucking game. Like, and you, you say it like in the best cricketers in the world, like Virat Kohli, right? Like big stage. Yeah, always there. Yeah, just those moments. Just take it, and almost like that pressure just almost adds to the to their game, and they become a better player for it. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I think that's. That's that's what separates the greats, right? Like the guys who can take on that pressure and adapt and overcome it versus the ones who melt. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was it was very interesting, like seeing the two sort of contrast because I feel like collectively, like the team that are playing now at Heathcote, just talent wise, like there's so much ability in the team. Um. But I feel like that Saints team would have beat anyone because they were just, they just had the self-belief and guys that weren't averaging like an 80 and, you know, taking huge bags. Like Tappy took quite a few wickets here and there and the whole scene was consistent. But it was just a case of like when the going got tough, they just all of a sudden stepped up and it was just so awesome to be a part of. Um, and I learned so much just playing with them. Um, but yeah, it was very disappointing on Sunday. Um, but yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, once you reflect back and you understand that, um, you know, all, all the whole team is quite young and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be stronger for it. A lot of them will individually will be a lot stronger for that, um, experience. But I think the key thing is to never sort of run away from that feeling. Like we quite easy, like in today's society, we just want to mask up you know, our, the way we feel with anything that makes us feel good, you know, whether it be Instagram, Facebook, drugs, alcohol, like that's the, that's the go-to. Like I feel shit. Okay. I'm going to do this. I'm just talking my phone. And at the end of the day, you should sit with what you're feeling, understand it and figure out a way how to get through it. Or, you know, next time you presented an opportunity or what have you like that in the, in the game, you know, that you don't want to feel that way again. So you can, you can be aware of that moment yeah and like that's so true like i think a lot of people just want the easy option you know like if you're fucking depressed take a pill rather than looking at like the underlining issues behind that or yeah like fuck i'm not feeling great so i'll have a drink mask it rather than doing the hard work and and actually you know putting in the the time like people just want that instant fix yeah um and and that is a fucking massive problem eh? like just yeah I, th I think all the the best things in life come from hard work rather than taking the easy route but yeah that's that's yeah. tough well we've got the sort of cricket out the way um let's that's pretty much the thing we've got in common <laughs> so it'll be nice to sort of understand a little bit more about you and you know what's what you do and for work and who you are as a person because i'm really interested to figure this out and the reason i say this and the reason i'm so keen to sort of um come be on your podcast and stuff like rocks my partner and i like we're um obviously from, both from south africa um and i always encourage you to get out and about and like network with people and just you know engage with people and and have that and to be presented with any opportunity to do that like I always push myself out of my no the easy thing is to just sit on your couch and be like i'm just gonna watch netflix yeah but i'd rather come out and and sort of have a chat and talk some shit and um you know get to know another person who are who have crossed paths with multiple times but i don't actually know yeah so that for me is like the big thing yeah and, and that's one of the reasons like i wanted to start this podcast is like it's not natural or comfortable for me at all yeah. and like in the past i've been quite socially awkward like not socially awkward just shy i guess quite standoffish um but cricket's just so huge for me it's like the one constant thing that i've had in my life and just loved like i just fucking love cricket i could talk about cricket all day um 
But I've sort of found like, even like within like close teams and things like guys, we, we spend so much time together on the field. And like, I found that like, I didn't really know guys in the team, like on a deeper level. And I'm like, fuck, we spend two hours on a Tuesday, two hours on a Thursday, eight hours on a Saturday. And it's all very like surface level, which I've just always found like wanted like a deeper understanding of people. Like, I feel like that's where the real value and friendships is and, um, just understanding like who someone is, what gets them going, what they're, what they're striving for, um. So I, I think it was, yeah, I did this to get out of my comfort zone, but also understand other people. And also on that, like, as you say, like me and you have played many times against each other. I've never actually had a conversation we've said hi and things like that. But of, yeah, well played. Yeah, yeah. And outside of that, like, not much. Um, and there's like, it's a pretty small competition, right? Like you always hear guys talking about other guys and other teams that they don't like or they like and... It's all just a bit funny, and I'm like, fuck. All these guys love cricket. They're giving away their time on a Saturday. Like, these guys should be guys that I fucking love chatting to, because, like, cricket is the common interest, and if you're willing to put that much time into your cricket, you obviously care about it to some degree. Um, and, yeah, like, I, I just... I've never felt like I've built those connections through cricket in the way that I should. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, it's interesting eh, that you say that because obviously you, if you don't actually get to know someone, you just base them on what you see. Um, and like, for instance, like, you know, the first time I saw you, saw this like big beefy guy come up to bat, I'm like, and you just bombed a six. I was like, oh shit, who's this guy? Um, but there's actually a pretty funny joke between um, uh, my mate Jack Harper and I, when we played, we played against um, East and I think it was, it was probably pretty early on when you just got there. And you're playing prems and um i bowled the ball to you and played and missed and then i tossed up tossed up one and there was a howling easterly at um, I nursery, remember that. The nursery ground yeah. going across and you fucking pumped it and you got caught 10 meters within the boundary yeah and uh we all came to the huddle and jack's like i'm not giving you that that's <laughs> That's six in my book. Like, he won that. Not you. I, <laughs> I was like, yeah, probably, mate. That was huge. <laughs> I, I, I fucking remember that because I was like, I was like, don't slog sweep. Hit him straight. Hit him straight. Don't fucking go into that wind. And then it was just there. I was like, oh, fuck. I was like, I've absolutely missed. <laughs> you smoked it. Yeah, it was straight into that wind. And I was like, there's no way. He, nobody's clearing with the, with the softball wind pumping. And, yeah, Hops always just says to me, he's like, Orlando's definitely 1-0 up. <laughs> and I was like, probably, mate. Yeah. Probably, yeah. Yeah, um, so, yeah. Um, but, how have, so when did, when did you move to New Zealand? Um, so, uh, 2014. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I was obviously born and raised in Durban. Um, went to a pretty prestigious boys' school, Marysburg College, same school as, um, Kevin Peterson, John T. Rhodes, David Miller. Oh, shit. Um, so kind of like equivalent of boys are here. Um, and just had the ambition of always becoming a professional cricketer. Um, made my first loss debut in South Africa at probably 18. It was 18, yeah. Um, and then sort of through different, different, situ like different situations that I didn't quite understand when I was there, um, I sort of got roadblock, kind of. Um, I was playing one format, not the other format, not getting full opportunity, and I kind of got a bit impatient and just uh, pulled the trigger on um, coming over to New Zealand. Um, but yeah, I mean, prior to that, things were pretty mapped out, like made, made South African schools, um, South African cults. So everything sort of paved up for me to um, move forward in a professional space in cricket um but i wasn't kind of getting where i wanted to fast enough so yeah i pulled the trigger and came to new zealand um sort of on the back of some soft promises um and i originally started up in northern districts oh yeah so i was um up in Whangarei for three years um where i played for northland um in northern districts a but the northern districts team was pretty pretty jam-packed um you know the likes of bolt and Saudi and 
They were, they were real they were, stacked there yeah, for five still, years or so. They were still playing a lot, and there was zero chance of me ever making that team. Um, so, yeah, I played quite a bit of A's um, and stuff for Indy. But then, yeah, sort of got, again, not much opportunity and whatever. So, decided to give my mate uh, from school a good uh, a ring. Um, my good mate from school, Chad. Um, and he sort of helped me um, find a club down here. Um, and yeah, then eventually came on to Christchurch and yeah, sort of set up shop here. And yeah. Yeah, that's, that's an, what was the um, first class system like over in South Africa? Uh, when us when we started, um, I don't know if you played against the guy, Nick Henry, played for Saints, left-handed batter. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. So he's my best mate, and we went to school together and everything. And um, I'm the godfather to his daughter and stuff like that. And he was um, him and I both sort of played first class cricket at the same time back in South Africa. And he was a serious gun back in South Africa, like yeah, like in the same conversation as Dev and all of them, like pretty oh, shit. pretty good. And um, yeah, he sort of got roadblocked as well. And I came over because I had enough. Um, and he then sort of followed me the year after. Um, and then, yeah, but when we were playing in South Africa, it was, we made our debuts and for instance, we played against Easton's. Um, I made my debut against Easton's. Nick was on tour, but he didn't play. And in that team we had, we played against Hardis Fulion, uh, Marshan Talanga, Imran Tahir, David Visa, um, Fahan Bahadine. Like it was a serious, serious crew team. Um, so you learn pretty quickly that you can't lunge in the front foot and you got <laughs> balls whistling past your nose. And um, yeah, it was, it was really cool. Um, and then sort of, we both, we both went to the Dolphins Academy um, and trained there and was there for about a year and a bit. Um, but yeah, just limited opportunity in, in South Africa. Um, but yeah, then then came over to South Africa, uh, came over to New Zealand, and you know, looking for green pastures. Was it were the roadblocks like the team was pretty settled, or was it like other other things going on? Um, yeah, so I don't know if you're aware of the way oh South Africa's past and you know the history of what went on in South Africa and yeah and stuff like that. Like um, when I was there, I wasn't really aware of all the um all the, all the sort of wrongs that happened back in the day um i grew up in my white bubble um and i went to a school that was you know three quarters white and you know there's this unconscious bias or unconscious racism that you get born with in south africa as a white person like you don't you don't understand it um because that's the, that's your norm you know you got black domestic workers, you've got black African um, garden boys, uh, what they call the garden, gardeners. Um, and, you know, when, you, when you're in the moment and you're there and you're like, fuck this, this is bullshit and whatever. And, but then when you come over to New Zealand and you understand how everyone sort of um, uh, embraces the past and embraces um, the culture that that is here um like the maori culture and and all that sort of stuff you realize how bad it was actually over there like still to this day like you go back and my parents who you know salted those people and and stuff like that they've got a bias in their mind um you know then it doesn't make them bad people that's just the environment that, that they've grown up in and that's the way they they see the world um but if you never left that environment you always going to see the world that way. Um, whereas like, yeah, I was sort of roadblock because of, you know, things like the, the quota system and all that sort of stuff. And I didn't understand back then. Um, and yeah, it's a really, really interesting concept, but, um, yeah, I'm way more aware of the reasons that those systems are in place now or were in place. But at the time I was just like really bitter and like, like this and you go leave yeah which is completely understandable 
Um, and like, I, I don't know huge amounts about like the past, but like from an outside perspective, like it's obviously horrible what's gone on in the past, no matter where you are in the world. But it's also hard to understand, like, so with, like, a quota system, does that mean, like, with each first-class team, they need X amount of black players? Yeah. Which, like, I don't think, to me, that doesn't, like, fix things from the past. And I don't know if I would, like, as a black player, like, understanding that maybe I haven't earned that spot through my talents, mm -hmm. but it's, it's due to the country's past that has got me there. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, like, how do you feel about, like, the quotas? Do you feel like that is a good way to start moving forward, or...? Yeah, I mean, I... I yeah, it's a, it's an interesting one. Um, because I can, I can look at it objectively now. Um, I'm not fighting for a spot and stuff like that, and... South Africa for a cricket spot or, or what have you, but I completely understand the reasoning behind it and it, and it has to be done because, you know, they, for all the white teams that people speak of that were, you know, never allowed to play during isolation and stuff like that, the great teams of, you know, the seventies and sixties and stuff like that, there were just as many colored teams and black teams that were also exceptionally good, but nobody ever heard of them. Right. Um, so they were never afforded the opportunity to ever, ever do anything. Um, a classic example of that is um, a guy who played for England, his name's Basil Dolabira, a Cape, Cape Town colored guy, m left, couldn't, wouldn't, couldn't make the Western province team or anything. He went over to England, actually ended up playing for England. Um, so I completely understand the reasoning behind it. My, my thing is that when um, apartheid ended in 92, the system should have been put in place way quicker and more at a grassroots grassroots level asap and then development would have happened naturally and ability would have been on ability um but it's not to say that you know the people of color that are playing are not good because they're no. exceptional yeah. like they are i mean kakisa robada is the best fast bowler in the world and probably going to be Africa's best ever bowler and you know he was always destined to play for south africa um, my, my, my sort of thing is like, there should be 15 cookies or robotics. There's that much talent in South Africa and the development. And, and that's the fault of the white person Right. that was in power. My, my opinion, um, from a development perspective, people should be granted opportunities straight as things, um, sort of changed and prior to that. And for me, like. The isolation and the um, segregation and stuff like that was bullshit. Like, for instance, like everybody prior to apartheid um, lived together. So, you know, I mean, I look at my lineage. I've actually just done an ancestry test just for shits and gigs. And um, I look at my dad and my dad's like definitely got black in him. He's 100%, 100% got colored. Like I'm definitely got colored blood in me, like hundred percent. And, um, I remember having a conversation with my mom and I'm like, oh, can't I just get reclassified? And mom's like, don't you say that? <laughs> and I'm like, what? <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, like I, I just believe that, you know, the fact that people were segregated in the first place is disgusting. And, you know, I, I will almost carry a guilt. To an extent when i go back to south africa because i'm like you know i remember driving down the road and like my parents bought me a car and i'm driving down the road and i see this um you know this this black african guy like walking up there uh, up this road down down by my parents house and probably started at four o'clock and has worked his whole life and he's like probably mid 60s and he's probably worked for so long and so hard and here I am, an 18 year old, white privileged, went to all the best schools, everything, and I'm driving this car. That this guy could only probably dream of. And he was never afforded the opportunity to grow, ever. He was always suppressed. And like for me, I feel that guilt when I go back to South Africa. So I'll never ever 
question the quota system in any way because I know that they're writing the, writing the wrongs of the past. And unfortunately, my generation, you know, are in the midst of the change and that's okay. And you've got to be okay with it. And, and I know that the sort of white guys that are playing in South Africa, um, you know, they accept it and they, they're doing well. And you, you look at the transformation that's happened in the Springbok rugby team. Like, it's been unbelievable. Um, and one of the guys I really admire out of that whole system is um, obviously the coach, that Rusty Erasmus. Um, and, you know, he, he sort of confronted quota, the quota system in front of everyone. Because it's always like this, um, you know, this thing, that this taboo thing that you don't talk about. And everybody knows it's there, but you don't talk about it. And he openly spoke about it. He said, we've got targets to hit and we will hit them. Because that's transformation and this is what this country needs. And this is coming from an Afrikaans guy who is, you know, symbolic of the apartheid regime. He's an Afrikaans boer from Free State. Like that's who the RV of beer were, like the most terrible things in the world. Like they were not good. And um, yeah, he's the one like the driving the change in the Springbok team. And, you know, all of a sudden you just saw this belief. It kind of stems back to what you're saying in terms of, um, you know, as a, as a, if you are making as a quota, um, you don't feel adequate or whatever. Now, Rossi addressed everything in the Springbok team and he gave all the quota players that you, that people think are quotas, um, the self-belief to actually go out there and, you know, you guys are the best players you play. And you look at the likes of, you know, Sia Khaleesi and Bongi Mbanambe and all these exceptionally talented black African rugby players, they're given the full license to thrive and express all their talent because there's belief in the system. And if there's no belief, if there's belief in the system, it works. But if there's no belief in the system, then it, it will never work. Yeah, and that's like, it's such a powerful thing if it does reap those results. And from what you're saying, it obviously sounds like it is working. And for me, like, obviously not knowing a lot about it, it's it's nice to hear that perspective um, rather than just being like, especially like, you know, yeah, like being a Kiwi, not knowing much about it and just hearing the quota system, like, okay, so are these the best 11 players, the best 15 players? But I think, yeah, if, if they're given the opportunity and, and it changes, like, do you sense when you go back home that there is a cha change is happening? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I think in general, like when I was growing up in Durban, where I come from, um, you know, we just lived in a little white bubble. Um, you know, I had my cousins down the road, I had this and that and private school there and big shopping center there and, you know, everyone's driving big German cars and you're living in a little white bubble, but just over the hill there's a third world country mm. like is squalor and shacks and you know people catching taxis to work and there's all this sort of stuff that you know white people just turn an eye turn, turn a blind eye to um and now when i go back there's definitely more of an integration um you know you're seeing a lot more mixed race couples you're seeing you know um you know black african people living in traditional white suburban areas um and it's all part of change and it's change is good yeah um especially for that country i mean just like equality in general across Absolutely. the board no matter where you are is so important like everyone has the same opportunities everyone has the same rights everyone has yeah. their their voices just as valid as anyone else's yeah you know like a human is a human 100%. regardless um that's an interesting one, like how you say, like when you go back there, you've almost got like a bit of like white guilt, even though like you've done nothing yourself personally. So that's quite like an interesting concept for you to take on board and like have that as part of you. I know that must be yeah an interesting one to deal with. Absolutely. Like I was just thinking now, you know, I've, we've had a domestic worker um, who was essentially like a maid at our house since I was you know, three years old and she's basically like a second mother to me. And, um, 
you know, when I go back there and I, I sort of just, I don't know, reflect and I, look, and I look at her and I see her like doing her work at, at home and I just think to myself like, and that's where the guilt part comes in, you think, what could she have been? And for me, like that's, you know, that's quite sad. Um, and the only reason for her not ever potentially pursuing a career in medicine or being an accountant or being, you know, some, someone that we deem of significance in the world is because she was suppressed. And that's why whenever you, whenever somebody talks about the quota system and stuff like that, I'm just like, shut up. Cause you don't actually know what you're talking about. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing. Like yeah. I, I know nothing about it. And that yeah, was just yeah, like yeah. my outside, like, is this the case? Like, yeah, yeah. Do, do guys feel this way? But yeah, no, it's... not every, put it this way, not every white person feels this way. Right. Like there's obviously hardcore, you know, victims and they're like, oh, you know, I didn't do anything. Whoa, whoa, whoa. But when you actually take a bigger look at it and see it from a bigger perspective, like it's the right thing and it's, and it's happening and it'll only be better for the country. Yeah. So was that quite like a, a culture shock? coming from South Africa to here, was it similar, different? Um, yeah, it was, uh, definitely different. So I'd say South Africans are probably more confrontational and like straight shooters than what Kiwis are in general. Like South African cricketers, the most competitive of face on the field, but also like the nicest off the field. Yeah. So it's just like real in your face, intense, like competition yeah. on and then switch off yeah yeah um yeah i mean that's just i think that's just our sort of upbringing like you know i try and get it to the boys at, at heathcote you know at the end of the day like your best cricketing memories aren't ones in a losing change room they're not <laughs> winning winning is the main goal like winning makes memories winning makes a happy change room winning and you know like i sort of put it to the boys, you know, I see winning as a bigger, bigger thing than just a game of cricket on thing, you know, it's communication, it's making sure you come to training, it's, you know, staying after the game for a beer, like, there's all these different facets of winning, um, that you've got to embody, and if you can embody it, embody it collectively, um, that's when you'll enjoy your time, like, you enjoy your games of cricket, you'll enjoy everything you do, and, you know, like to try and drive at the end of the day, like the way I see it in cricket, um, and especially like guys that are playing at, you know, even premier club level, you know, we're all competitors. That's the reason we're playing there. Like if you don't want to win, then what's the purpose of us actually being there? Like we all want to win. So yeah, for me, winning is huge. It's huge. And driving that mindset in the culture is very important. Um, and yeah, like I, 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 I encourage the guys to get competitive, like you're playing tiddlywinks, you're playing golf, you're playing rock, paper, scissors, win, back yourself to win. Like you got it. Yeah. I think that's probably something that's not hugely taught in New Zealand. I don't think mm. like growing up and I, I suspect it's the case now. It's like a lot of participation certificates and you know, like, rather than, fuck, you're the winner, or, and that's, yeah, like, I'm not a huge believer in, like, well done for participating, but, you know, like, we're here for a purpose. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so how have you, is this your first year of player coach at Heathcote? No, second year. Second year. And had, had you done like a player coach role before that? Yeah, so I'd, I've gone to um, England four times. So I've done it a couple, well, four times in, in the UK. Um, and yeah, I've, I think I've, I've learned a lot through playing the game and all the different ups and downs and all that sort of stuff that I feel like the stint that I've had at, at Heathcote doing the co player coach role it's probably been personally one of my best and my most rewarding just because I have that um, experience and, and whatever that I can actually provide some genuinely good things to young guys that are wanting to 
you know, enjoy their Saturdays and, and play cricket competitively. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been, it's been really good there. Um, and they're a great bunch of girls. Like they, they take feedback openly. They don't, they don't, um, they don't get upset. And I think one of the main drivers is, um, the honesty that I provide them. Um, but also coupled with the honesty is the care factor because I genuinely do care. Um, it's okay to be brutally honest, but if you're saying it from a place of you, you don't actually care about the person, then it's only going to hurt this, the individual. So, you know, the key thing is all our boys and our squad know that I care deeply for A, the club and them individually. Um, and, you know, emotions are, are real in, in sport. Um, and they can be seriously powerful drivers um, if, if sort of utilized in the right way. Um, and I believe like engaging with those things, being aware, being uh, acknowledging that stuff only makes you a better person and it enhances your EQ. Um, so yeah, that's, that's one thing I always work with with the boys is like making sure that they, um, you know, know what they're up to. You know, from a mental process perspective, from a, you know, a training perspective, anything. Just make sure you know what you're up to. Yeah, that, that's so important. And I think, like, the boys knowing that you care is a, a huge one. Because then that, that gives you that ability to be brutally honest with them. And I think that's probably something that probably, from my experience, doesn't happen enough. Um, and it, it probably is just, like that factor of oh i don't want to upset the boys or but i think if if you realize the person delivering those messages does actually care and want you to develop it's like a completely different thing um but yeah like what um obviously you've had a fucking pretty pretty full-on incredible year with the bat has anything changed in your game that you think's like led you to these consistent streaks of scoring hundreds and just runs for fun really um no not not really to be honest um yeah it's been i, I felt good for four years really it's just a case of you know some big scores being the end result like i've been in the exact same mindset done the same things maybe even less occasionally um but yeah it's just been a, a string of of good scores um yeah not much has changed to be honest um and that, that's correct right like you you have times where you feel fucking good and then you just knock off or you find a new way to get out and you're just like fuck i feel great but i'm just getting out yeah 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 i think one thing that changed and i wish i'd found way earlier in my development and career is like you know, we constantly get told, you know, cricket's a, it's a mental game. Um, and it's 90% mental. And it's like, throughout my whole life, I got told, oh, you got talent, you got this, you got that. And I always just thought that that will, that will take me, you know. But you also get told how mental the game is. But how much actual training do you do around the mindset stuff? And, and you know, what is your mental processes and, and that sort of stuff. And... Like I've always been an avid trainer, like wake up at five o'clock and go for a run. I, yeah. You want me to go for a run at, at six o'clock? I'll go at five o'clock. Like training's never been an issue for me. And I um, remember it was when I first came to Saints, I was sitting on the roller at Christ College. I was listening to a podcast. And um, I don't know if you've heard any of those Nike train podcasts. No, I haven't actually. There was a, there was a podcast with a guy called um, Andy Puttycombe the founder, co-founder of Headspace. Oh, ah, yeah. Um, and he was talking. And I actually goosebumps one thing about it now. And I was like, listening to him talk, and I'm like, holy shit, this resonates massively. Like, I understand what this guy's saying. And basically, he was talking about, you know, the mental side of sport. And um, his, he's actually a really fascinating individual. Um, he um, went through some real dark times um and essentially packed his bags and left for tibet and became a monk um and then what he was in i think he was a practicing monk for about seven years 
and decided he wanted to move back to the Western world um, and bring this to the Western culture. And he moved over to America, started found his, his mates and started up um, Headspace. But anyway, long story, he um, was basically talking about the mind and sport and the flow state and, and all that sort of stuff. And basically the essence of the flow state is to be fully aware and immersed in the moment. Um, and you can train yourself to do that. But the only way to train yourself to do that is to actually be able to be fully aware of what's going on upstairs. And if you're not fully aware of what's going on upstairs, you're never going to be able to concentrate on what's right in front of you because you're always thinking about what's going to happen or what's happened. So basically after the podcast, I just got like heavily into like meditation and um, that was a massive change for me just in terms of being able to deal with, um, you know, failures and successes and, and stuff like that because we know as cricketers um, there's a lot of downs um, but there's also some ups but we like drug addicts we want the up the whole time and we don't get that and then we get real down on ourselves and but we still come back because we want another head of that thing and then but you actually learn um, through meditation to keep an even keel and you know understand that you know everything's forever changing like for instance, same mindset, different result. But as long as you're consistent with one thing, you're going to be, at some stage, your ability will be able to flow through, and and um, those end results will become, you know, a different different series of of um, things. So, yeah, basically learning how to be more present for longer periods of time, and training yourself to do that. That's for me was profound when I was about twenty eight. Um, and that's why I said I felt good for four years because I learned, I've learned the importance of being able to be present. Um, and a big one for me was, you know, I've, I've always been so solely focused on, um, well, for the last five years, I'd say solely focused on the team's outcome. Like that's my driver. That's, that's what drives me on a Saturday. I want to win and whatever I can do to make the team win, I'll do whether that's a, gritty 40 off you know 100 or if it's a uh, 140 off off 80 like i'll do whatever i need to do to try and win the game um and that's that basically takes the pressure off your end result personally and then i try to focus on the moment and then you strip it back and you go right what's um what's being done right now how do i come back to this moment right now and little things like I don't know, I will bat and I'll just like look at the sand where the pitch is. And I know if I'm looking at that, if I'm fully immersed in, you know, how my breath's moving and stuff like that. I know when the ball's bowled, bowled at me and my body, my mind will just react to whatever's getting put down. Because how many balls have you hit in your life? Trillions. Your body knows what to do. you just got to be able to be present. And that's the thing, like, and I don't think a lot of guys are aware of maybe how much their mind is shifting throughout an innings and how cluttered maybe their thought process is um and that and that's what i've found and i've said it a few times like i was fucking struggling for runs and i didn't didn't really understand why and then i went back to my batting notes from when i scored some runs last season and it was just like it was my thought process like as the bowl was coming in like it was just all over the show it was just thinking about where I should play a shot or what the ball was going to do. arm, was it shoulder? No. Exactly. And Natural. and all it was was taking it back to watch the ball and looking to score runs. Like, that's all you need to do because you fucking batted in the nets a million times. Like, you know how to play cricket, you know? Mm. Like, all you need to do is be in that moment, as you said, and just react. And, like, you will play how you play. And I think that's a big change in my game particularly like the last three, four years, is like just removing that fear of failure. Like I'd always go out to bat and be like, fuck, I get to bat once on a Saturday. Like I, I don't want to face one ball, two balls, three balls, you know? So I'd go into my show and not play any shots and I'd think, oh, time at the middle at least, like I'm making the most of this experience. But then when eventually I got out, I was like, fuck, that's not how I want to play cricket. And I think just like understanding my own game and how I want to go about it has been like 
really freeing in the fact that like I can go out to bat and I'm like okay I'm just going to accept whatever happens in this innings like as long as I play how I want to play and I make sure I'm focused every ball if I do that I'm happy like if I walk off with five, ten, hundred, whatever it is, like, as long as I follow that process and trust that in the, over the long period of time, that's how I'm going to get the best results. And I think that has been a big thing. And I notice sometimes when my mind does start to go, like, and on reflection, like, fuck, that's the ball I got out. Was that one ball that the mind drifted? Fuck, if he goes full here, I'm buffing him over the top. Gone. Like, just went away from watch the ball, looking to score runs. Yeah. And it's just, that's something I've been trying to get through to the boys, but, and I was saying to Dan Van earlier, I think it's like mindset and things like that almost have, like if guys haven't been exposed to it, like it's maybe quite an uncomfortable or like, you're just like, oh fuck, how much does that really have to do with it? Like, oh man, I'm working, I'm working with, um, Philippe Bosova and our, um, overseas Dutch guy and mate like he is immensely talented like can bowl ripping league spinners and is an absolute jet with a bat but he's so upstairs like muddled in terms of what he's trying to achieve and stuff and as soon as he figures that out he'll be like he wants to stay and play for Canterbury he'll, he'll play for Canterbury he's seriously talented um but yeah it's an interesting one you talk about mindset and and stuff like that so for me mindset is basically your set mind. So I'm going to be aggressive today because we're chasing 350. Right. Then it's a case of you going out, being present, watch the ball. So, you know, if you're, if you're going out there being like, I'm going to smoke everything, then it's like a case of like, you're actually giving yourself a preconceived idea of what you need to do to every ball, but you're not actually reacting. So your mindset is, I've got to be positive. This is what we're chasing. Cool. I understand that. Then you walk out and then it's a case of, body and mind doing what it can do to the best of its ability and the only way you do that is if you're present um because you've already stated you stated your intention and then you walk out and you you go and just be present and back yourself yeah do you have like any like verbal cues or anything you give yourself like as the bowl is coming in or you just sort of um sometimes i just say sometimes same thing like watch the ball um but then, yeah, I just sort of like look at the dirt or whatever and then look up when the ball is in his last five strides and watch the ball. Just focusing. Just watch the ball. Man. Yeah. It makes the game a lot easier when you simplify like that. And, and I've said on here a million times, like there's guys in our twos team who are fucking great. Like look at them in the nets and like, fuck, you hit the ball so clean. And then Saturday for twos, can't buy a run. It's just like, yeah. It's, it's nothing, te- I don't think it's anything technical, like you've got all the physical talent in the world, but it's just something, yeah. overthinking, overcomplicating, whatever that is, um, yeah, I think, yeah. The, the, I think like with that, you know, listening to that podcast and, and getting into meditation, being in meditation now for like the last four years, um, you become a lot more emotionally intelligent like i'm quite an emotional person but i never knew how to handle my emotions and um sometimes they still get the better of me but i mean when i was younger like i've done some really questionable things like (laughs) in the uk i got banned for i think it was like three weeks because um i nearly got got into a fight with my teammate i punched the hole through the the club room door I broke a bat on a thing, like bad stuff, (laughs) like just no handle on my emotions. But through meditation, I've learned that, you know, any emotion you feel, any thought that pops in your head, anything you feel at all, you know, they're essentially just fleeting. And once you create that space between yourself and those things, then you have the ability to not attach yourself to it. So for instance, you're batting and you're gone. For me, for instance, two ducks in a row. I've got two ducks in a row in the last two games. Am I am I thinking about the third duck? Yeah, it pops in occasionally. But I know that it's just a thought. And all I can control is what I can control. And that's a case of me doing the same things I've been doing for the last four years. And 
you know, will the result be different? I don't know. I'm not a future teller. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to be consistent with what I do. And when I step into, step onto the wicket and into the crease, I'll do the exact same thing I've been doing for the last four years and whatever the outcome is, the outcome will be. Um, but it, it's the, it's the ability to not attach yourself to the emotions and not attach yourself to the feelings or the thoughts that allows you to be present for longer. And in saying that it also helps you to deal with anything that you've encountered. So for instance, Sunday, seriously emotional, not good. I know how to deal with that now. You know, when I was younger, I wouldn't know how to deal with it. I'd be in a terrible state, but I understand that, yes, the only reason I'm feeling that way is because I care and I'm, and I'm passionate, but I don't let the, the emotion get the better of me. So that that's where I think meditation is so good and just the ability to do it. Yeah, and, and that's hugely important, like going back to like the two ducks in the row, thinking about the third, like absolutely at that thought's there, but I think the difference is not acting on that thought right like how many guys would be sitting on two ducks and like fuck i need to get off the mark here i need to get off the mark maybe push a single that's not there poke out at one that's not there just to get some bat on ball get that one run where whereas in reality that's the thing that's going to cause them to get that third duck rather than just going out there and, and batting like sure that's a thought put it to the side it's not relevant to me going in batting yeah i understand like thoughts and feelings and emotions they only gain power when you give them power. So if you can create that space, like that's when you actually see things differently. Um, and you're not, so for instance, like in everyday life, you know, we think about, we talk about depression and we talk about all these sort of things and I've, you know, been through all that sort of stuff. Um, so much so that, you know, it got, it got pretty hairy for me, like, I don't know, probably 2014, 2015, I got into quite a, deep black hole where you know i was drinking a lot um i was smoking weed every day like just to try and sleep and shit like that um and i was so obsessed to, obsessed to trying to make it um and things weren't happening but i was like almost forcing the issue and you know if you try and force something it doesn't happen um you know and i went through all the the dark times and stuff like that and i really felt that um you know i I wound the clock back, so it was probably like 2014. I, um, yeah, I went back to South Africa and um, I was catching up with a mate um, and I was just, you know, going through some some bad, dark times and, and like I said, smoking weed, drinking alcohol and um, I just sort of said to myself, like, this is not the person I want to be. Um, I need to figure out, like, what... You know what is this, what does this life actually hold for me like what are what i want to do for the next five to ten years so yeah i love cricket and i want to play cricket but there's no ways that i'm in a state of mind to ever do anything with this game like it's not so anyway i you know met my partner miraculously met my partner in the midst of all of this not in a great mindset and she's just she was just a, a godsend really um and she made me see life a lot clearer where cricket was my be all and end all all of a sudden you know she opened up my eyes to understanding that it's like she barely knew what cricket was and she had so much joy for life and so much um zest for life and and what have you and basically um yeah it got me thinking in a different light um and then yeah just eventually moved over here gave it one last crack with with canterbury and and whatever and managed to get into the A's and play cricket and, and start enjoying cricket again. Um, but I know for a fact that that would never have been the case if I wasn't able to actually deal with my shit prior to coming back over here. Um, so yeah, it, it was an interesting time um, during those dark, dark, dark times because you only really find something better once you do hit rock bottom. Um, it either takes rock bottom or something significant in your life in order for things to change. Um, and like, I, I, yeah, I believe like it shouldn't have to get to that space if people just embrace, embrace like different, different ways of thinking and, and being curious with the way, um, you know, p 
people le- like be curious with with different ways in which to better yourself. If you can if you can really have that curious mind and 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 try and um, be be the best version of yourself consistently, like that's when I think that um, you'll see the magic happen. And, and like that's just something that I purely believe in is just like developing all the time. Like I'm 32 and I feel like I've done fuck all with my life. Yeah. But I still have that hope. Like I'm just a hopeful person. Like I will do things with my life, you know, like it's if I go, fuck, you're 32, you're a fucking loser and give up. That's when I'm fucked. But it's like, no, just start doing things, you know, and like things will get better. It's just continuously developing, like learning to communicate better and understanding my own mind like a lot better over the past like few years and meditation's been huge for me as well on that um i just think life gets a lot of people down but almost maybe not down far enough so they, yeah. they're just sort of scraping oh, right. along the bottom and maybe 10 15 20 years go by before they actually realize fuck i haven't been in a great state but i wasn't in a bad enough state to change things so I, I guess it's like be, being more aware of where you're at and, and taking action when when re- required, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting, the human mind. Eh? And um, I guess meditation, to an extent, gives you the understanding of like... I know what, one thing, one thing uh, there's a bit of saying you obviously you probably know is keep death by your side. You know, and essentially one of the guarantee, the only guarantee in life is you're going to die, you know, um, how do you want to be remembered? Um, and have you had a good day? Like if we had to peg tomorrow, like have you have a good day today, will you come, will you, or were you, were you the best version of yourself to everyone? That's, that's the sort of question you should put you, you should ask yourself when you put your pillow at night. Um, and if you can consistently do that, then I think, um, I think you'll be happy or live a fulfilled life. I think the biggest, the biggest fear for me is to, you know, be on my deathbed whenever 70 or whatever, hopefully, um, and you think, where the fuck did that go? Yeah. You know, and that, that for me, like frightens the shit out of me. Why didn't I do this? Why didn't Why I do, I do that? This? Why didn't I do that? Why was I so unhappy for so long? Yeah. You know, so yeah. And, and that's kind of like where I am. I think like for a long period, I was just, scared to be to be myself almost like i'd rather just be quiet go unnoticed um not really put myself out there not try the things i want to try due to the the fear of what other people might think of me and and all this kind of thing but like people so ingrained in their own lives i've just sort of come to the conclusion like as long as i'm like a kind person i'm not hurting anyone actively sure I'll, I'll make mistakes and, and hurt people unintentionally but as long as I'm being kind trying to help people um, in some way because I think everyone on earth has skill sets which probably aren't shared enough you know like everyone's got different skill sets and if, if we share them with each other we're all collectively going to grow and I think you probably you get that through coaching you know like you want you want to help people you want to share your experiences and, and what's worked for you and, and pass it on to other people so they can enjoy their sport even outside outside their sport like with mindset and things like that um yeah so like i wonder how much of a fact that plays in other people's lives like but it's like this podcast like i was like i just, I just need to do it i need to do it i was like fuck but then everyone in the cricketing circle is going to see it everyone will then know me and i'm like fuck i don't want people to know me and it's just like no okay no just do it be yourself as long as you're kind if they don't like you that's fine but it's just like a hard concept to accept for well for me it was just to like be genuinely who i am yeah um and it's taken 32 years to get there yeah yeah but as i say like it's just continuous development and not giving up and pushing through and doing doing what it is you want to do and not having those regrets on your deathbed yeah 100 100 um 
Yeah, I mean, John Quinn, the mental skills guy from um, Canterbury, always speaks about like, the best version of you. Like, what does the best version of you look like? And until you identify and define what that looks like, you can't necessarily live it authentically. You might try, but until you know what the best version of you is and what it, what it genuinely looks like, um, you know, I think you, you're always going to be sort of struggling to try and fit in here and, you know, your mates are all getting on the piss, like you'll go do that and guys are, you know, smoking and you'll go there and you'll just do whatever you do to try and fit in. But until you're so secure in your own skin and understand who you are as a person, um, that's where that genuine confidence comes from. Um, and if you, you know, people, people think like, I look at a guy like Kevin Peterson, for instance, like phenomenal cricketer, but probably the most insecure human on earth. Like you listen to him talk and all he will talk about is himself, like on commentary, like you listen to him next time and it's like, um, you know, they'll be talking about I don't know, some guys smoking a hundred and then you're like, yeah, when I was playing this and this and you're like, <laughs> mate, it's not about you. Like you've been retired for 10 years. Like just relax, you know, but he just wants the affirmation that, you know, he's a, he was a good player yeah. because he's obviously never dealt with a shit when he was younger or he just doesn't know how to handle himself. Um, and yeah, I think once, once you authentically understand who you are and the best version of yourself, then you become so much more confident. And I think people, you know, they pick up that, that energy and they understand that and they, yeah, they, they resonate with that because you're authentic. Yeah. It's, it's hard to come to terms with, um, like t tonight I actually went to a singing lesson, like for the first time in my life, like one of my mate's friends was like running a course and I was like, fuck, I've always wanted to be able to sing. Can't fucking sing to save myself. Yeah. But I was like, fucking go try. Like, why not? Like, and like, I didn't tell anyone at cricket. I was a bit embarrassed about it. And you're the first person I've told, but I'm like, fuck, like, it's just a thing. Like, it's something I'm a bit interested in. Like, fuck, why not try to learn how to sing? Um, but even that is still like hard to say even though like it's probably not hugely embarrassing like it's just an, it's a hobby right like it's like anything um and I, I feel like people probably hide a lot of things that they they sit on the fence about and they're like fuck what will other people think about this and yeah yeah definitely um i mean the same the same can be said for you know um mental health and and stuff like that i mean for instance, like on Sunday, we were talking, someone said something and I was talking about a therapist and then one of the guys part is like, oh, do you go to a therapist? I was like, well, oh, occasionally. Um, and they were like, it was like almost like a shock. And I'm like, do you go to the chiropractor? Do you go to the physio? You don't have the same reaction. So why all of a sudden do we have a reaction to that sort of stuff? Yeah. It's just because there's a stigma attached to it. So, you know, from a singing, like your singing lessons and stuff like that, there's you, you assume that there's a stigma attached to it. So, or there is a stigma attached to it. Like you're the, a different sort of bloke, but essentially it's just singing. Yeah. It's, it's like me going for a ski lesson. Yeah. It's yeah. exactly the same. And, it, and it's one of those things that you just build up in your mind to be more than what it is. Yeah. And it's just, yeah. Do you, do you feel like you're like fully confident in who you are and pretty, pretty open about things? Yeah, yeah, like, I think the authentic confidence um, has grown massively just with, um, you know, understanding who I am as a person. When I didn't know who I was as a person, you know, I was acting consistently, and that can get tiring. Like, you're trying to be this thing that you're not. And, um, you know, from a, you know, I think about from, like, the early cricket days, and it's like, you got the fancy haircuts and you've got like the gym muscles and you're like, you know, doing all the, all the things of the fancy sneakers and like, you're trying to fit in one of the, it's like, do, does Tyler, the, who the best, like, does he actually care about that shit? No, he doesn't. So like, like I said, um, once you, once you figure out the best version of yourself and, and, um, who you are as a person, that, that confidence, um, you know, it's natural and it's authentic. Um, so yeah, like I'd say, um, I do have that, that confidence. 
um, in, in, in myself. Um, but you know, there's obviously always times when you, you sort of doubt yourself in certain aspects. And, you know, for instance, when I, um, didn't get, um, a contract and stuff, I was like, well, you know, what the hell am I going to do? Um, you know, I really was backing myself to play for another four years. I finally got in and all that sort of stuff. Um, and you know, went into building for a year and hated it, but I did it. And I was again, like not, you know, confident in that because you start off as nothing really, like you don't know what you're doing and, and stuff. So that confidence I'd built up and from a cricketing context and a life context, I had to use everything like the cricket stuff are gone, but I had to use everything from a life perspective. Now moving into the working world with, with building, um, which was a challenge in itself. So, you know, that, that authentic confidence was still there, but it was challenged massively when you're in a space where you're completely out of your depth. So, yeah. Yeah. That's so much true. And I feel like I've never really had the confidence because I feel like a lot of people judge you based on what you do work wise and work wise for me. Like I've just never valued money. Like I've just, I've, I've never desired anything like material or anything like that. So I've really always struggled to have the motivation to work and I've always had the fear of getting stuck in jobs for a long period of time. So I'll, I'll work a job for six months and I'll get bored and then move on to the next thing and just keep, keep going like that. And like, I don't even know what you do for work. And I, I hate, I just despise like that question. Like that's typically the number, like the first question everyone asks, what do you do? Mm -hmm. Like, like somehow that makes up the personality of the man, which I just, I just don't believe like, I don't care what someone does. I, I care what they're interested in, what they value, um, what they're doing outside of work um, and things like that. So, yeah. It, it's it, interesting. I eh? like, I didn't realize that you were so like, I don't know. Um, your EQ was so intelligent. Like I didn't, no offense. Like I, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't realize that. I thought, you know, you're just, uh, yeah, you I play golf, play cricket against and, um, it was just different. So like, it's actually really interesting to hear how you, you sort of speak about, um, what you value and, and stuff like that. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I, like, these are the, like, it's, it's just nice to get to know you on like a, another level and like, even just like how you go about things like you being into meditation and, and, and what you do. It's just like, these are the things that I would never discover outside of this. And, and even like, um, with guys within my own team, like they'd listen to like Tom Gooday and stuff. And then they're like, Oh fuck, I never knew this about you, Tom. And it, it just, it sprung conversations. And I can already feel like even those like small insights into a guy's life mm -hmm. has sort of brought some of the guys a bit closer, a bit more understanding and like, yeah, that, I, I, that's all I want to know. I just want to understand people, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah understand what they're about what gets them going like i don't care what it is you could be into anything like as long as it gets gets you going and you're passionate about it like yeah definitely i've always been um you know once i've always been fascinated with the mind as well like you know that dictates everything really like how we perceive the day tomorrow like it's all based around you know what i'm what state of mind we're in when we wake up and and that sort of thing. And, and that state of mind is determined by, you know, previous days that we've had. So there's so many th intricate little things that, you know, you need, um, to be aligned in order for your mind to be in the right space. And I just, I'm just so fascinated by like, um, things like neuroplasticity and, and stuff like that, like the ability to rewire your brain. Like you can perceive one thing for a period of time, but then in a year's time, you can perceive so that exact same thing completely different. Um, so it's like, it's really, really interesting. Yeah. And I, like, there's a lot of people out there who are like, people never change. And yeah, like, that's just, I just don't believe that in any sense. Everything's changing. Yeah. I, I believe you could do the most horrific shit. And if you work on yourself, you can become a completely different person. Yeah. Um, it's just the method of how you go about that. Um, so outside of like meditation, is there any other tools or anything else you use? Yeah, I think, um, well, I guess it's probably a form of meditation. There's two things I do, um, 
the Wim Hof breathing. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, so I do that quite a bit. Um, yeah, it's amazing how that sort of goes hand in hand with meditation and, and stuff like that. That helps quite a bit. Um, and then surfing as well. Ah, uh, yeah. So I come from Durban, which is a surf town in, in South Africa, and I've surfed since I was about 12. So, yeah, it's a bit of a different experience in New Zealand, obviously, cold water. I grew up surfing in board shorts and, you know, like sweating while you're surfing. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I find the ocean such a peaceful and calm environment. And, um, you know, if you spend an hour out in backline surfing and, and whatever, I feel really refreshed mentally. Um, and I don't believe that there's a better way to start your day than going for a, a dawny. Um, yeah, I mean, in the summertime, myself and Wallace consistently go for waves and, and stuff before work, and it's epic. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Yeah, I, I love the beach, eh? Even just, like, I've never surfed before. That's something I'd like to try. Yeah, but even just, like, walk along the beach and then just going in the water, like, just such a good reset. Um, I um, I got an ice bath in the freezer, in the garage, but it's been broken for, like, two weeks, and I've, like, noticed, like, a huge... I've really struggled like with the heat and like just not having that like mental reset during the day because it's just so powerful to to put yourself through that and like starting the day like fuck getting in the ice bath like the last thing I want to do and then like once you've done it and overcome it and get out like you're just like fuck if I can overcome that I can overcome whatever else has thrown me like i think just doing something hard early in the morning is there's so much value whether that's like an ice bath hard cardio or something along those lines like and then like fuck i've done something really hard the day probably can't throw much helps at me you know like i've already overcome that task yeah and i've already already got my mind under control yeah um yeah 100 percent um I mean, another thing obviously is, you know, you wake up and once you've had your shower and stuff and you go meditate, like if you, in a, if you've had a bad day the day before, like your boss has got angry with you or you've had tricky customers or whatever, and you're pretty flustered or you're anxious or you're this and that, like, I reckon one of the toughest things is to actually sit down and, and be quiet with your mind because nobody wants to sit with an anxious person. Nobody wants to sit with a frustrated or angry person. So those sort of things are also really tough you know like i do see value in you know doing something physical and pushing yourself from a physical perspective but sometimes like from a mental perspective to actually just sit down with your mind um for a lot of people i'd say 90 percent of the population 95 percent of the population it's very tough and they cannot do it no and like for me like that's a challenge um and i i swear by it and i do it every single day because I know that, you know, there's times when I'm going to wake up and I'm like, don't want to do it, but I'll do it. So is that like a, a set routine, like in the mornings, first thing, meditate? So I have a, I have a shower, cold, cold shower, and then go through, have a coffee and then meditate for like between, depending on what time I need to get to work between 10 and 20 minutes. Yeah. Every day. Just to make sure that, you know, I'm fully present and. You can just catch yourself like when you're at work and you're getting flustered you can just take a breath understand like you are, you have the tools to be able to deal with this and then you get on to doing whatever you're doing and it makes you appreciate moments way better and wins and you know losses and different different little things in the day that you if you were cluttered and, and not th- present you probably would miss um so yeah that, that's that's one of the things i mean with the ocean I do love also like just doing um, day trips like on a Sunday or whatever, go out to the Banks Peninsula and, um, you know, if there's waves, I'll surf. But if not, I just go park up on a beach. Um, Like they're always isolated and you just park up out there and just do some new time and chill. Yeah, it's so important. And I I think meditation is like, it's probably got quite like a negative connotation with it like and people are like, oh, fuck meditation like it's almost yeah. got like an eerie fairy feel to it to a lot of people who haven't done it or and it's just yeah it's like anything to do with the mind i think people and maybe that's just the easy option you know yes. it's the easy option to say oh no that, that's bullshit rather than taking the hard option learning about it trying it 
Yeah. Yeah. Because they, they have it, it's again, it's a stigma. They're like, oh, you're sitting on a cushion and humming. It's like, no, I literally just sit in a chair with, a headfo- with my headphones in and I listen to some prompts and I just sit quietly for and be present with my mind. And now I've got a way better relationship with my mind than what I did when I was not doing it. So why would I? It's like basically going to the gym. Like you got to do bicep curls because you want big biceps. Like you want to calm clear mind. You got to sit and work with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on the cricket side of things, do you still have like desires to play first class mm-hmm. cricket? Um, it's a good question. Cause, I've, cause like from my point of view, I can't fucking believe that in the last two years you haven't played. Mm-hmm. I'm like, what the, what the fuck is going on there? Like, I don't, I don't know how the system works, but it seems like it must be a bit fucked. Cause like nothing against like, uh, Dylan Hunter. Like, he came from Australia into club cricket. From my understanding, I, I don't think he scored huge amounts of club runs, and then he's playing for Canterbury. And I'm like, that, that it just doesn't sit right with me. Like, in terms of, like, I'm like, fuck, if you want to move over shore, score lots of club runs, and then get, like, I'm all for earning your, your opportunity, right? And, like, I just see with the system, like, it, it doesn't seem to be the case. It doesn't seem to be you earn your way in Mm. but yeah it's an interesting one i mean to answer your first question i've never ever lost belief that i can do it and play at that level um and i've never lost the desire to do it um you know just certain things yeah haven't really gone my way in terms of selections and and whatever that have afforded me an opportunity to do that um unfortunately but you know those sort of things with with people coming in and playing and stuff like that. Like, obviously I look at that and I'm going, you know, it's bullshit. Um, but at the end of the day, there's, there's not much I can do. Like I literally can't do anything. I'm not the one selecting the team. So, um, I mean, I caught up with John Quinn the other day, the girl sort of relationship with him and, um, I had a massive rant and whatever, but at the end of the day, he said, you know, sometimes coaches have just got a flavor of the month and that is what it is. And at the end of the day, it's like, there's not much you can do. And if you start beating yourself up, which, you know, you, you can, um, you're just going to put yourself in a sort of dark spiral hole and you're not going to enjoy shit. And so I, I, not to not think about it, but I don't, again, try and give it, let it have any power. Yeah. Yeah, like no, nothing against Dylan Hunter. I don't, yeah, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't yeah, know yeah, the guy. Yeah. Um, and like, if I moved from Australia and, and got given it, you're not going to say no. no like, no. like he's he's just, yeah, you're not going to say no to that. Yeah. But like, I, I just don't understand. Like, to me, cricket is the fucking easiest sport in the world to select for. You could virtually look at the the top five run scorers, the best five bowlers, pick them, and you'd have a reasonably decent team. Like, sure, some of the guys wouldn't be up to it, but like. When you're consistently scoring runs, it's like, what else do you have to do to get that opportunity? Yeah. It, it, it just does not sit right with me. And if it's like, if there's no value in scoring runs at the highest level you possibly can, what's the fucking point? Like, like do they, do they just not see club cricket as a selection, like, line? Like... Yeah, it is. It is an interesting thing um, because obviously, like, you know, you you do some like the season. You know, sort of had this season. Um, you do you do sort of look at your phone. And you're like, well, is somebody gonna give me a call or, you know, it's, at least just be like, hey, you, you're scoring some runs. Like, shit, man, good shit. And nothing. You don't get anything. And yeah, it is. It is frustrating. Um, and there are questions that I've, I've sort of posed to relevant people um around it but yeah it's an interesting thing at the end of the day like the way new zealand systems are structured um is everything is essentially geared towards the black caps um and your domestic teams are pretty much feeders to the black caps like um and if they don't deem you you know that you're going to play for the black caps in the next four years or or what have you they will maybe maybe favor someone who's younger that may do that 
and I know probably Dylan's not a great example, and I, it also baffles me. I don't actually understand the logic behind that, but that's the, the previous reason I gave you is the one that I try and make peace with. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it is it is quite an emotional thing for me because you know I've always believed I've had the talent. I've always been told I've had the talent. Um, and you know, there was a little eight year old boy f back in South Africa who fell in love with the game and, you know, harbored all these ambitions and went through all this controversy and turmoil and did all these sort of things to reach a point where you are in a space where you know that if you have granted opportunities, you would take them. Um, and I've been in that space for the past four years, but you don't, you don't get given them. And that's just something that, that you know, it does eat it, eat away at me occasionally. Um, and I've had many a rent to rocks, my wife and many, many a rent to my mum and dad and, and stuff like that. But, you know, at the end of the day, if you don't, um, if you don't focus on the things that you have, you're always going to lust for the things you don't have. Yeah. But at, at the same time, it's just like, it's just horrible because I, I don't think like you could go to anyone else and say that you ha you haven't deserved that opportunity mm. and when you have earned an opportunity and it's not given to you for whatever fucking bullshit reason is put out there like it f it fucking winds me up and, and i'm not you you know like i'm i'm like angry for you and guys in your situation who put in the work score the runs take the wickets and they don't get that fucking chance and it's just like there needs to be like more clarity around like selection. Why has this guy been selected? Like the, I don't know who's in charge of it, but like the guys in charge, like, you know, like it's not just like, it's guys playing club cricket. I feel like everyone deserves to know reasons why guys are and aren't selected in it for it to be like one person making that decision. It, 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 I don't know. It doesn't sit right with me. But I mean, you're a fucking hero for being able to control those thoughts and and easing them. You know, like yeah. it's not. It, no, no, to be honest, it's not easy. Um, and yeah, I mean, like I've been like recently been dealing with a whole bunch of emotions and stuff around it because you know I feel like if I got granted an opportunity in, in like next week, like I've I've almost got a hundred percent belief that I would take it because I know I can play at the level. Um, but you know, like I've been trying to deal with it and I should tell you a funny story and it's like, my mind was just full of all these thoughts and, and whatever. And I went to the sauna and, um, I was like sitting there and I'm like, had this awesome sauna, like got my head clear, had like a couple cold showers and I was actually feeling quite good. And, um, as I'm walking out of the sauna, this guy goes, Tyler. And I'm like, oh yeah, I don't know who it was. Um, and he goes, congratulations on all the runs you saw him, mate. And I'm like. Uh, thanks and he goes has Canary called you and I'm like <laughs> fuck sakes <laughs> this guy <laughs> like, fuck back in the yeah, sauna <laughs> like, oh. um, but yeah no it's um, it has been pretty tough and yeah more so this season because I felt very good so yeah and I appreciate your kind words as well um, it means a lot and yeah and I, I and you know you, you do get the vibe from other guys that you know they back you like no one would ever say anything if I was to get given an opportunity, no. like, you want to be like, oh, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. And I know that. And that's also a tough thing to live with. Um, but fuck, that's the reality of it, mate. Yeah, it's, have you ever like considered like going to Otago or anything like that or being in talks with them? Yeah. I, I mean, I've always like, I'd consider anything really. Um, but I'd never be able to go down there on like a, uh, or half, go anywhere, yeah, like a half chance. promise yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Um, just because, yeah, I'm just in the situation of our lives. Um, we probably can't, I can't afford to do that. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate. It's just the people, you know, like people at the, at the selection level and, and whatever. And when they make these decisions, I know they've got to take emotion out of it and they've just got to base their decisions around what they see and what they believe is the right thing and what for whatever reason they believe you know this sort of direction is the right thing and that's you know that's their endeavor but like that's where i don't think i could ever be in that space because 
um, you know, I, I think about it from a more emotional level and I'm like, you know, if you're going to piss on someone's dreams and ambitions and stuff. Like you'd love to just get, um, you know, some valid reasoning around it. Um, but you know, sometimes you just won't get it. You just get told because I said so. And you've got to be able to deal with it. See that, that's a fucking piss. Like, yeah, that's a fucking piss take. I would not take that well. Eh? Yeah. 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 But I mean, like, like I said, just just give me a reason, even if you're fucking, it's a half-ass reason. Give me something to work with here, like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. That's the thing. It's like, if you if you want a, a clear-cut reason, they'll probably give you some random one, and you'll be like, "Well, that's not true." Mm. Um, and then at the end of the day, you still gonna have to deal with the same thing. So when you're seeking that stuff, like, is there really a point? Probably not. Because at the end of the day, the outcome's still going to be the same. Because the fact of the matter is, if they wanted you, they would have had you already. So that's that's the crux of it, unfortunately. Um, the one thing that I do believe is um, with the system, and I think it, it is a systemic thing around um, New Zealand cricket in general, um, is that you know they're not paying enough attention to the rec game, and I think that. You know, if you don't look after it, it can quite easily just start crumbling. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, if you start nipping the likes of myself in the bud and, um, you know, anybody over the age of 25 and what have you, you know, you're killing off a whole, whole um, generation of creators. So, and even guys that are going to be younger than that, because if you go in you know, contract a guy that's you know fresh out of the 19 system and whatever, and he's not actually ready to play first class cricket. All of a sudden, that guy that's 25 looks at that and goes, "Fuck this, I'm done. I'm gonna go work, and I'm gonna get pissed on Saturday because I'm not. I don't. I don't harbor the ambition to play anymore because you've just you'll know what you're gonna do. Yeah. So for me, like they've got to be careful in that sense. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, the the rec game is really important to the feeder, uh, in, in terms of the development of cricketers and and stuff like that. And I don't think it should be taken lightly, um, especially from a selection perspective. Like, mate, I'd love to bat on flat wickets and know where the ball is, bloody bowling at every every <laughs> every ball, and umpires that don't just get you know on triggered by three appeals and you know one you know <laughs> one blind eye and stuff like that so yeah you know it's it's not like it's that much easier like i'd say you know potentially club cricket to an extent you know is is tougher because the wickets are not as good um the bowlers are not necessarily as good ball swings a bit more um there's all those like weird factors that make club and it's once a week um I think it's quite tough. I've I've always found like going up the levels in cricket is so much easier than going down the levels. Like going back and playing like toes, I'm like this is fucking tough. tough yeah. This is tough. There's no pace on the ball. There's ring fields. Got to hit it for six or block it. Like yeah. And yeah, like flatter flatter tracks and and all that stuff. Yeah. But, I'd um yeah I mean I guess for me, you know. I, I just don't want to put my head on the pillow one day and be like, Fuck, I just wish I had been given a, a shot. And be, so like if anything ever had to present itself, I'll never say no, because I would definitely go and do it because I want to test myself at whatever level I can. I've still got the hunger, I've still got the desire to do it. It's just a case of, you know, getting, if I'm fortunate enough to get granted an opportunity like that. But if I'm not, I'm also okay because, you know, at the end of the day, I've got a, I've got a loving wife. I've got, you know, a home. I've got so many things that I can be grateful for. And like I said, like, if you start lusting after the things that you don't have and what you should have, um, or what you think you should, you believe you should have, um, you, you slowly start to fall into that victim mindset and that's possibly the worst place to be on earth. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm glad that you've you've got that mindset, and because someone in your same situation who doesn't have those skills, mm. they would just fucking crush someone. Yeah. So like, 
obviously you, it's it's amazing that you've got those processes in place and, and have the ability to deal with something like that. I also fucking hate how like age plays a factor. Oh. Like I I don't even I don't even believe in like you know like most batsmen retire what 35 36. I don't see why you can't be playing to your highest level to bloody 45 or whatever like unless like your vision goes like as long as you keep yourself physically fit and and still enjoying the game. Like you look at like Darren Stevens or uh, Jimmy Anderson I think Mishbel Huck scored test hundreds at 42. It's just like, it's these like preconceived ideas of age. But like, I, I just don't buy into those. I think like the human potential has, there's just so much. And guys haven't even like pushed the boundaries of what's possible. And you see that in guys like Jimmy Anderson, like it just keeps going, keeps playing great cricket and I, I suspect a lot of that's to do with him just learning more about his body and like he looks lean, he looks fit and he's probably learnt how to manage his body, his nutrition and just improving that over time, which allows him to, to keep doing what he's doing and, and developing still at that age. Yeah, he's got better. Yeah. And like, I, I, I completely agree. Like, for me, it's like when you chuck your eggs in a basket from like he's like oh we you know we're gonna put all our resource into a, a 19 year old that guy has not experienced life yet he doesn't even know he hasn't gone through any ups and downs and 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 those sort of things like who knows if he's even gonna like cricket at 24 years old like you know but um yeah, yeah i don't know i just i just believe that you shouldn't write off someone because of you know where they're at of life from an age perspective like I can still do the same things now as I did when I was 19. Like, I still move the same. Like, and I'm sure it's probably the same for you. Like, yeah, it's a, it's just an interesting concept. It's it's a bit of a scapegoat at times, I believe. Yeah. Um, because you only meant, sort of start reaching your mental maturity at, like, between the ages of, you know, 28 and 32. So, yeah, um... Yeah, I, I feel like I'm in a, in a good space to to sort of play on any stage that I could get my hands on, to be honest. But, yeah, we'll see what potentially happens. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I hope you get a chance at some stage. That's but, right. Um, yeah. 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 No, it's... Um, the professional era, the professional um, game is, a, is an interesting... It's an interesting spot to be in. I think, um, yeah, it's just... Yeah, it's a, it's a very competitive environment um, until you're in a space where, um, you know, you're, you're pretty, pretty solidified in the, in the space. Um, but everything underneath, so your A programs and stuff like that, it's, it's, all, it's, it's, a, it's a strange thing. And I know it's the same in South Africa with um, like second 11 cricket and, and even in the UK, second 11 cricket. It's like, it's like these trial matches consistently. And like, it's, it's one thing I struggle with is like not playing for anything. Like, I need to play for something. Yeah. And, like, if it's for myself, then it's, like, essentially, you know, it's a bit more... That's not necessarily more pressure, but I just feel like it's not... I'm not the focal point. Like, I don't want to be the focal point. I want my team to be the focal point. Um, and if I if I form a, you know, a piece of that puzzle that wins something, like, that's epic. That's what I want. Um, so, like, the second 11 games and stuff like that, those are, those are tough play because there's no... I don't know, the games have got no niggle, they've got nothing on them. They're yeah, like, yeah. just like, you rock up, you play, and, you know, you go to the hotel, and you do this, and you go home. And it's like... It's a bit strange. Let's put some money on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. what, what do you think about, like, the the formats we play in Premier Cricket here? Um, I really like them, to be honest. Like, I like the... I like the two-day format. Um... You learn how to set up games and yeah then you've always got two bites of the cherry to win the game like especially if you like lose first innings you can come back and win the whole game which for me is like pretty pretty exciting what i'd like to see and i think probably be beneficial for the comp is to make a better t20 comp i because it was that, terrible that wound me out this year that was terrible. three games what's the fucking point terrible and then for the two-day games i think that it should be what the three-day games were where you have two pools 
and you play against each other and then the two top teams play in the final at Hagley Oval over two days for the last game of the season. Yeah, that'd be great. The only thing that, like, like I struggle to get on board with, with the, the two-day stuff, like, in that first innings, it, like, it just feels like a one-day game to me. I'm like, you, like you're not going to see guys scoring, like, double tons. Like, you can't bet long periods of time. Like, 60 overs is still longish, but it's not like a real, you're not, you're not betting a full day, you know? And I, I imagine that's a tough balance at club, club level, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. Yeah. I think, I think, I think the way they've got a structure, especially for club cricket, it's, it's okay in the two day games. Like, yeah, if you've got the advantage, so say like you bat first and you're two down with 20 to go, you can post the total that the other team would probably have to try and bat twice. If you roll them once, they're going to have to bat again. So it gives you that opportunity. Um, but yeah, I know, I know what you're saying, like learning the essence of being able to bat for long periods of time and stuff like that. But I'd say that that's more the next level. That's the development piece. Yeah. Um, but I'd, li- I'd like to see Metro really, um, you know, get a bit more innovative from a T20 perspective and, and just make it more of a spectacle for the club game. Like what they what they did this year was just atrocious. What what happened there? Um, apparently, um, the comms back were that everybody liked Tudor cricket more than T20 cricket, and they didn't like the fact that there were no semi there were no semi finals in the T20 game. So they just randomly condensed it. Like us, for instance, we played we played Park, and we blitzed them. They they scored. 140 and we chased it in like 14 overs like smoked them then we played Maryvale Pap and it got rained off and they snuck a game against Sydenham and beat them in five overs like a five over game like Sydenham oh, batted Jesus. and then Park somehow faced five overs and just snuck over the Duckworth Lewis and won that game and then we had to beat Sydenham to go through because they were playing Park were playing Maryvale so then all of a sudden Park we're through and, and playing in the semi-final. And it was just like, oh, how does this work? Uh, it was very simple for us. We lost one game. We got hit for six off the last one. We lost that. Oh, yeah. And then the next week, we tied. And it was just like, Out. game over. No. And like, in the previous year, we played, what, eight or... Eight games. Yeah, it's just a piss take. And I don't, I don't even understand why, like... You don't even necessarily have to play 2020s on a Saturday. You could just play Thursday nights, right? Like every club team trains Tuesdays, Thursdays. Why not for eight weeks just take Thursdays off training and play T20s? Or like you don't have to play Saturday games. It's uh, it's just too big of a format. And I I, I love playing T20. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of guys do, right? Yeah. Well, um, it's 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 like it's instant results. It's fast paced. It's all those sort of things and like what you know everybody likes like you said everyone likes to play it so i don't understand why it hasn't become like a spectacle of club cricket here like they should have i mean i even wrote in when they asked for like opinions and stuff like that i i sort of said like how have we not got like a big finals day like we should have um like a saturday where you play so like my suggestion was before the Christmas break is you you play your rounds and whatever and then you make the semi-finals and then the semi-finals are like at the at the top team's ground. So like say East Shirley won the they were top of the round robin, they are automatically in the final. And for the rest of the comp there's no one playing and everyone else is encouraged to come down to the ground and support and, and watch the finals day. And the cricket community in Christchurch comes out and watches the finals day. And in the morning, you play the second and third team playoff and they play against each other. And then in the afternoon, the final and everybody, you know, as like a, you have like a little cricket festival afterwards. Yeah, that'd be like, great. how good would that be? Yeah. If it was at East or if it was at Burnside or it was at the Valley, like it would be such a spectacle and something to play for. Like I could just see it being a massive success, but it takes time and effort to organize something like that. And but probably not even that much time or effort. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I, I don't. I don't know who who runs. I think Dan Van was telling me earlier who works there, but 
and maybe there's moving pieces that I don't understand but from like my limited outside perspective it seems like something fundamentally has gone wrong yeah um and that and people like I guess they shouldn't um dismiss the impact that that would have for the cricket community in in Christchurch like if you have like that so say at East Shirley you have that on a Saturday and you've got some you know little whippersnappers playing in the back there and all of a sudden they see Landon Neal walk out there and they start smoking big sixes and stuff all of a sudden that guy just gets a twinkle in his eye and you know he's another cricketer that's going to be there till he's 28 you know and that's what that's ultimately what their goal is and like for me like those things are so important um but yeah, they, it's, it's less about getting through the season and more about improving the season from my perspective of what they can do. Like, I think it needs to be looked at that. Yeah, I, yeah. as I say, I just couldn't believe when I saw this. Like, I, I was genuinely close to starting like a Rebel 2020 league. I was like, fuck this, this is a joke. I mean, it would not be hard to go into Christchurch City Centre and get some sponsorship from some big, you know, your PWCs and... Deloitte's and fuck, they they've got cash to burn yeah. like you could quite easy say that and be like we'll give you you know x amount of advertising and you know do you want to sponsor this cricket thing and put some money up for the clubs you know like have a have a thing where you know the winner makes x amount and whatever and and stuff like that and like it would be so good yeah that would be awesome yeah that'd be great see. like i don't know why people or why it hasn't been done because could you imagine like a a a club who wins the comp walks away with five thousand dollars like shit that's cool like it'll be so much for the club and it'll mean so much yeah yeah yeah, yeah. even just like talking about it just winds me up a little bit hey yeah yeah but yeah. um so who, who you guys got this weekend uh Maryville. they're about 70 behind i think uh yeah one down so Hopefully, hopefully we'll, we'll get over there. What's the situation of your game? Um, we scratched our way to 150. Um, and then they were about, we came, we started bowling, we bowled a heap of poos. And they were about 60 for no loss. Um, and then we managed to get on a roll and we ended up, yeah, they're about 180 for nine now. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, no boys pulled it back well we've got about a deficit of no it's about 190 so it's just about a def deficit of about 50 so we've got to score that th those 50 runs and then set them something was that at home no it's at sydney it's quite a good wicket got a pace in it and yeah it's nipping around a bit so it's nice but it the same as always slow and low low and actually the burnside wicket on sunday was quick like there was zip off the deck, eh? Like, bowlers were actually getting it through, and... Yeah. It was the first one of the season. I'm like, oh, there's a bit of, bit of pace to it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so your game on Sunday was that quite a tough one. Yeah, fuck. Every time I face Alex Tate, cannot fucking hit the guy. He's the one guy, like... Like, all other bowlers, like, have had some success and failures against him. I've just fucking failed every time, eh? He was just swinging it real late, and... I was batting like a fucking dickhead. He's um, he's an interesting one. He's a pretty handy club cricketer, eh? like good bowler, like real good bowler. I'll tell you one thing that he's what he's been doing for years, and no one has picked it up. And it's so frustrating because I tell umpires all the time, his back foot cuts the side side line oh. when he goes that does that wide of the crease ball. It is. I'm literally watching. Like I've watched so many times. <laughs> I'm like, so I've actually pulled away before, and I've gone to them. I'm like, listen, his back legs. I'm watching his feet as they're cutting. And then he won't bowl it again and then he'll go from the lane and bowl it and i'm like i know his back foot stuck cutting there the whole time eh? yeah i imagine that's one thing the umpires just would no. never pick up on eh? no 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 Burnside, Burnside are a good team i yeah. think they're, they're a pretty good team like um a lot of people um you know I, I guess matt hay is the captain and a lot of guys get have like opinions about him and stuff like that but in all honesty like I've got a lot of time for the guy. Like, I don't think he's the worst guy. He's just a serious competitor and he gets a bit salty and, you know, and, and that sort of stuff, which I don't know, I kind of like. Yeah. Because I think, you know, I see a, a little bit of myself in that. Like, I'm like, yeah, fuck yeah, you're competing. I like it. 
So he's like, he's a real competitor and stuff like that. So I really, I always enjoy playing against him and, and competing with him. Yeah, well, like, that's like one of the guys, like when I mentioned, like you hear stories about guys, like I've never interacted with him ever, but like I hear from some of the guys like that they, they don't like him or whatever. And it's like, that's the guy I want to talk to and, and sort of figure out what's going on. Yeah. No, he's a, I, I get on perfectly fine with him and we always end up having a beer and it's just, yeah, we probably like, we probably both um, the two worst losers in the team in the comp probably like we both hate losing so I don't know I think there's like a little bit of joy from both of us like when one loses and one doesn't yeah. so like when we when we pants them I just like sitting with them having a beer and they're like oh, yeah, good game mate <laughs> and then I think it's the same for him <laughs> when they beat us he likes to sit there and, but yeah no it's um it's good I mean I really enjoy playing club cricket in Christchurch it's good fun though yeah. No, fuck, we've been going an hour 45. Oh, yeah. Should we call it there? Yeah, you got a big day tomorrow, Abby? No, not huge, actually, no. But <laughs> thanks for coming on. It's been bloody, no, bloody no good. No, 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 no. Thanks,